In episode 6 of the Greenville Weekly, we discuss the realities of community and school gardens with Tyrone Day of Restorative Farms. Katie goes over winter care for goats. Ricky talks about goal setting, and we discuss manufacturing goals and timelines. Hey, I just wanted to set up this next segment. It's about um, the notion of community gardens and what it really takes to keep them going. And sometimes they they have failure points. And uh, my friend Tyrone and I spent some time uh, pre-COVID last year. We were trying to do a much larger project and then uh, COVID happened and life happened and we weren't really able to finish this. But this was a segment that we pulled out for Urban Farm Academy last year. And it was, I think for me, the most important impactful part of the day because um, I've always kind of, I, I, I have to be very delicate with, with the way this we say this, but we're friends here so you can take it. But I always get a little annoyed when I see the same memes over and over again or the same signs that, that say, uh, you know, why is there not a, a school garden in every single school? And people like take all these issues with how come there's not a school garden. But what you're going to come to find is and Tyrone says it really well. He says it way better than what I could ever think about saying. Um, I, I would tend to be a little bit more to the point. But having a school garden is is very needed, and I support it wholeheartedly. So don't take it the wrong way. But I want to make sure that if we go down the road from individual school district to individual school district, that it's set up in a way to succeed. Because my issue that I take with the whole thing is, let's say you have a school district they put out a garden and they don't think through everything externally and it fails. The lesson that's taught to children is, hey, gardens are a waste of time. Gardens are not a good vocation. Um, every time somebody comes up to the school, there's this dilapidated greenhouse and I've seen them. Um, it just sends a bad message uh, versus if we go down the rabbit hole a little deeper and go, uh, and you'll hear Tyrone say this, there's always, there seems to be a lot of money to start them, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of follow through with a hiring the right teacher instead of just thrusting it on, on somebody that may not be, um, willing to put in the work to learn what to do. They may not even want to do it. Um, school districts are funny with the way they're operated and they're all operated a little different. And while there is many success stories out there, there's uh, way more failures, unfortunately. So whether it's a school garden or a community garden or any kind of, um, more of a social platform, I think the lesson and the reason this is so impactful to me is because I want to make sure as these things are set up doing social good that they can think long term and that there's ways for these things to not only continue to be funded, but for them to stand on their, on their own. So the way Tyrone does his stuff is is it's very awe inspiring and I'm very fortunate to, to have some of these folks uh, within my circle and I hate that we don't get to spend enough time with them, but uh, listen to the things he says about community gardens and what it takes to start them and to keep them going and to keep people's interest in it and uh, enjoy. Well, this, this garden has been sitting dormant for about two years now. It's never really been productive. When I ran for Miles of Freedom, I think he had a little interest in it. But this is what you have people that spent seven to $80,000 in and look at it. And we want to be able to help this garden and help this community center here. This is South Dallas YMCA. We want to be able to give back and help fix some of this by employing and you know, engaging with community. If we can hire some people besides me to come and train the children here or what have you to do uh, actually a, a expert job to be able to create a sustainable garden right here. Well, it always start when you don't have a curriculum, when you don't have a curriculum for the people, when you don't have a person with the fortitude to be able to manage the garden, or the facility itself don't have the time as far as to you know, get people out or what have you. But it always stop when like, if I come in now as a specialist and I train and what have you, and that's all they want. That's all we we say we can do. We can train. Y'all can pay us if y'all come up with a, if y'all come up with the uh, 
the monies. I can train people to do what they need to do there, right? But when I leave and they turn it over, we turn it over to them, that's when everything drops off. You have to have somebody that's going to push, push, and push and be able to create curriculums and programs and be involved with people, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, get out there and rub elbows with people and call people out from the community to do what they do. Because if you don't do that right there, I mean, that people going, they're going to lose interest. And, uh, hey, and you have to have somebody from that community to be involved. You know, but if you turn it over to the end, uh, how would you say too soon? You have to keep, you got, you, you have to let your state be known enough in these places like this. If you're not laying there to do a year or two, you know, and it's not even worth messing with. You know what I'm saying? You have to be ready to put in a couple of years with these people. But a lot of pe places like that, they just don't have the money, you know, or, or they just don't have the time. They say they don't have the time. You know, and some of them have the money, but they just can't find that certain person to be able to run that facility. You, know, you got people who you can pay and they'll show up, but they won't do the work. You know, that's one of the things that I like doing. Consistency is everything with restorative forms. Consistency, we like being consistent with everything. You know, I mean, people can come out and they'll have, they'll have the fortitude and the zeal and, stay there uh, two or three months or what have you. But then as soon as you bag away or you gone and they don't have nobody to step in your spot to bring that out, that's where it stops at. You gotta be able to bring, bring the people out. Whatever shell they're in, whatever, whatever they got going, you gotta get in there with them and show them and teach them. But the more they learn, the more interest they have. The more they see the benefits, the more interest they have. The more training they get, the more interest they have. The more incentive you get them, if you hire somebody, the more work they'll put in to bring the people out, you know, like me. You know, I'm not an easy guy as far as giving up. I don't like, I mean, I'm not one of those guys who, I mean, it's like, you gotta take me the distance. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the whole mission the distance because that's what I believe in. That's what I'm here for. Uh, the challenges is all around her. Like you said, the mentality, the theft, the crime, I mean, the, uh, how would you say, the uh, the financial situation, low income, what have you, it's, it's, it's constant here. But it's a battle that, you know, well, it's a battle that you can't just, you can't give up on, you can't stop, because it's gonna constantly be that. Thing about it is, the more we do, and the more we can show as far as training and be able to give and be able to do what we do, you know, we it don't it don't take a lot for us to be able to do what we do. But we do need money to do what we do. And we need the people in place to do what we do. Uh, it's it's like with us, we are uh, our mission is to do what we do. We wanna create jobs, we wanna create healthy lives. We want to create sustainable gardens. We want to be able to aware the people of what to eat, what not to eat, healthy foods, what not. We want to be able to create a hub as far as agriculture, in South Dallas, in Dallas. And we want to go as far as we can go with it, not just in Dallas. And that's our mission. And the more people we can get involved, I mean, we feel like we all can bond together and create this big global thing. That's what we're do. And my mission is every day I hit the ground running on doing what I do. Hi, Katie from Bootstrap Farmer here. I wanted to share some of the things I do for preventative care with my goats. So I brought a bunch of herbs down that I like to give them. Um, little lavender, they don't necessarily eat the lavender, but it's nice. <laughs> um, it's nice to have in their area. And then oregano. Oregano is huge. It's an antimicrobial and they love it. So Lou just joined us and she's getting to try herbs with us for the first time. So these are just a few things that are kind of a nice treat. And then I've got some rosemary. Um, this is actually really good for their respiratory. So and for pregnant goats, which Lou is pregnant, so. The other thing we did today 
As we set up the water, um, we set up a larger water for our goats. Um, one of the things when you're shopping for a heater for your water for your animals is to make sure that it's safe for the type of material that the tub is made out of. So if you're using like a Rubbermaid, make sure that the heater that you buy is combat compatible for that. Um, the other thing to make sure is that you can have a direct line to it. This is not something that you want to have loads and loads of extension cords leading to. Um, and last, just make sure that you keep your water very, very full this time of year. Um, one thing that I do to kind of keep the worm load down on my goats is I use basic H2. It's a little more concentrated um, version of the basic H that you probably read in, in a lot of the urban farming and homesteading forums. So for this 50 gallon, I'm gonna do about a half of a cup. And basically all basic H2 is, is a mix of corn and coconut oils and alcohols. And what it does is it, it coats the outer layer of like the nematodes and it breaks down their coating so that they're not as a, they're not able to like defend themselves against the goat's immune system. So just maintaining this is really helpful. The goats don't even notice. So that's how you keep the worm load down and that's how you care for goats in the winter. The process of rebuilding our food system is underway. Indoor farm technologies, zero waste food establishments, shared spaces, subscriptions, and even food trucks have opened up a universe of opportunities to be part of the sustainable food movement. This is relevant for the people feeling stuck, waiting for the right moment to stick their foot in the door. Some choose to clock out in spectacular fashion, some choose to start small and bootstrap it. Creating an impactful change feels like a big task, but thousands of us are out there doing it anyway, learning on the fly. Rapidly evolving technology is changing the way consumers connect with food, but it's also giving us the tools to start something new. Trailblazers in the hyperlocal food economy are creating templates through the businesses that they create. Networks of farmers, producers, artisans are building hubs providing for the local food economy. Restaurants exchanging their containers with their farms. A network of vertical farms with no land or rent via service points. Farmers taking a larger share of the supply chain through their farm-grown meal plans utilizing a shared kitchen. Turning herbs into a craft cocktail out of a food truck. Making a career change isn't for the faint of heart. Many of us face challenges when evolving into something new. But we know, by learning from each other, we give ourselves the opportunity to maximize our resiliency and impact. By getting clarity, we move towards the life and the legacy that we can be proud of. The Urban Farm Academy is a network of entrepreneurs who are leading this change. These are people who left behind careers in all stages and walks of life and decided to do something different. Cast your vision on creating, designing, running, and scaling a profitable business that moves you towards the lifestyle that you set out for. Connect with others and accelerate your learning curve. Forget politics. We're embracing the opportunity to be better entrepreneurs, better leaders, and better stewards of our environment. Create something that has value, profit, and a social impact in whatever scale that fits your ambition. Turn your evolution into a revolution. Explore the Urban Farm Academy. So you gotta come in or what? Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today I'm gonna to talk about goal setting and you're actually gonna to get to know me a little bit in this video as well. Um, today I'm new to the Bootstrap Farmer family. For those of you who don't know, my name is Ricky and I am the newest member of the Bootstrap Farmer team. I actually don't have a background in growing, farming, or agriculture at all. I actually have a background in health and fitness. I've been in the fitness industry now for 10 years, uh, predominantly in, you know, big box gyms, the, you know, then the, if you can think of it, I've probably worked there. Let's just say that. And um, this is my first season with Bootstrap Farmer. And I wanted to talk about um, some similarities that I've seen between the two industries that at first I was a little surprised by, but the more I thought about it, the more it made sense to me. And goal setting is, you know, 
it's something that happens at the beginning of the year. You know, typically, at least from the fitness standpoint that I'm used to, it's the New Year's resolutions. Everybody wants to get back in the, you know, in the best shape of their life. The holiday season, they were eating, 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 you know, quarantine, you've been in your house, you haven't been able to work out. So, you know, goal setting to, to be a better version of yourself and to take care of yourself uh, is something that I've seen for many, many years of, you know, in a row. And at the same time, you know, January, uh, all hell breaks loose. And the agricultural industry and the gardening industry is the exact same way. You know, it's, it's going to start to warm up around the same time. You know, the holidays are over. People can focus. It's the new year. What, what new things do I want to go do? And, you know, it's, I have such an emotional, let me, let, let me take a pause here. I have, why I loved working in the fitness industry so much was I got to be a part of someone's experience and someone's journey into taking care of themselves. And in that case, it was their bodies. You know, you're, you're moving, you're, you're not just sitting on the couch, you're, you're building muscle and all the, you know, all the great benefits of exercising. And I see gardening and homesteading and farming as a means to take care of yourself. You are either using that as a business to provide a service to other people, or you have your own home garden and you're growing your own vegetables. You're sustaining a food source for yourself. And it's the same idea. To me, you're just taking care of yourself in different ways. And I, it, at Bootstrap Farmer, I'm on the team of customer happiness. If you have called, if you've sent an email, if you've sent a chat, if it's it been in the last few weeks, you've probably spoken to me, so hello. And I've gotten a lot of calls recently of new gardeners, people who have never done this before and they're excited and they have no idea what they're doing. Or, you know, they've gardened a little bit here and there, but now they really want to take it seriously. They saw what COVID could do to a food system and they want to learn to, to, to take care of themselves. And to me, it's the same thing is if you're going to go into this, if you're going to go and start this journey into taking care of yourself in this way, you have to know what you're going to walk into and you need to be prepared. And that's the same advice that I would have given someone that was in my office that I was talking to about joining the gym. I would say, I love all of these amazing goals that you have for yourself, whatever they, you know, they were, whatever the, por the person told me. But this is what I see as what we can do for you. Or, you know, I want you to be as prepared as you can. Like, I want people to know the realities of what they're going into, the great realities and what they should expect. I, you know, it's so funny because the most common garden vegetables that people want to grow, at least in my experience, have been some of the most tricky to grow, at least where I live. Tomatoes and peppers, they love a season that I don't readily get here. And, you know, I'll call people and they're like, yeah, I want to grow this big, juicy red heirloom tomato. And I'm like, okay, do you have any growing experience? Like what, you know, what have you done? I want to get to know someone and their experience and why they want to do this. So that way I can give them the best advice. And it's the exact same thing as being in the gym to me. And so I've picked up very quickly how to assist you guys, which is awesome. And when you're setting a goal and when you're setting out to do something, you you're, you're committing to that. When you set out to go do something, you are committing time, resources, energy to something. And I want you to, if you are going to start something, if you're going to start your health and fitness journey, or if you're going to start your gardening journey, I want you to stick to it. And I see a lot of people possibly not sticking to their gardening journey the same way that I see people won't stick to their health and fitness journey. Something will happen or something will not happen. And people will just be like, well, it's fine. This isn't for me. Or, you know, this isn't my community. This isn't my crowd. And I fear that. That makes me very sad to know that that's going to happen. And my job and, and my passion, more than my job, it, 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 my passion is to make sure that doesn't happen and that you guys, whoever stumbles upon this video, whoever picks up a phone and calls and interacts with me is prepared and that they stick with it. 
And that whole just, I don't even know what to call it. That whole, the, the rather those two similarities in two industries to me that just seem so different from each other. A lot of it's the same. I just want to end this video and say, whoever's watching this, whoever stumbled upon this video, don't give up. Don't let one failed plant, don't let one diseased plant, don't let one died crop, you know, what, don't let one failure or one setback keep you from growing your food or doing whatever it is that you're doing, growing your cut flowers, growing a garden that you just want to look at. Don't let one bad season or one incident, one squirrel eating up your sunflower seeds to stop you from taking care of yourself. You went into gardening wanting to take care of yourself in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter what you tell me. I believe that you went into that wanting to do something for yourself, whatever that was. And I don't want you to give up when something happens because inevitably it will happen. It's either going to happen or not happen. And it's going to make you feel a way. It's going to make you feel discouraged. And I've been there and I don't want you to give up. So don't. And... If you just happen to stumble upon this video and you're not even sure how you got onto a gardening video, but you're on your fitness journey or you're on whatever journey that you're on or whatever goal you've set for yourself here at the start of 2021, don't give up. It'll be worth it. So I would love to hear what you guys are doing this year, gardening, farming related or not. What goal have you set for yourself? We would love to see it in the comments below and come back for our next video. Bye. Hey everybody, it's Nick here. I'm standing in our 30 foot prototype for the greenhouses that we're fixing to fast track into production. I'm 6'1", this is our, our standard double door so you can see how gigantic this thing is. And if I walk over here to the side, again, 6'1", at the sidewall, look at all that headroom. Well now that you've seen the greenhouse and uh, hopefully you're ex excited about it as we are, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the manufacturing process and why it takes so long to do uh, seemingly something that, that everybody would think that we would have, a 30-foot hoop house. Obviously, there's a market for it, but we're not going to just put something out that, A, we can't stand behind, and B, just to have it out. We wanted something different. We wanted something better, and I think that right now we really have that. So that starts the design process. On paper, I wanted a taller structure. I wanted a straighter structure. There is some integrated uh, wind and truss systems that are going inside of this. Um, it's not just a matter of copying something else. It's being innovative within uh, the industry and making sure that we're bringing something that we're very proud of and that we're confident that when you buy it, uh, whenever you call us, it's to thank us and not to say, hey, you missed something, which is why we have this prototype. So once those designs are, are looked at, we then have to do two more steps before we even got even close to where we are today with this uh, structure up that's behind me. That's number one getting with our uh, vendors and suppliers and saying, hey, this you, you know what we did last year with the 20 foot and the 14 foot, are you guys going to be able to handle this? Can we get this uh, materials? Is it made within the United States? Can we get it fabricated here? All that needed to be worked out and planned for and, and all that kind of stuff. So as you can imagine, it was a major investment for us, but it's one that we believe in and we know that we're pumping jobs back into uh, our economy and our country. The next thing we had to look at is our own internal systems and storage space. Last year, 2020, we were very fortunate to be able to double, a little bit more than double the size of our warehouse. And this year, we break ground here in another couple of weeks on another massive expansion. And with those expansions, it's to, to have room to have this. It's not only storing uh, the big parts, it's receiving the big parts, it's making sure that we can package it, ship it, and then, uh, and then have room for everything without just sitting outside. So we had to make room uh, internally for ourselves. We had to think, can this ship, once we go bigger, is it going to be uh, something that we can make sure that uh, is not going to be a, pig pain, a big pain for you uh, on the farm side? So once all those details are kind of hammered out and we have the space and we talk about it as a company and we talk about it as a warehouse facility, you know, how are we going to do this, where are we going to store it, then we get to do uh, take those plans that we talked about and take it to our fabricators and go, all right, it's go time for this prototype. And the reason we prototype it out is because it's way different looking at something on paper versus being upstairs and, and putting on that ridge pole. Things change. Uh, 
little kinks get worked out, and having something physically to manipulate into place uh, means that we're making sure that once you get it, all those little bugs and kinks are worked out. Making sure that every piece of hardware that we're planning on this is uh, going to be the very best that it can be and be easy to install, and at the same time be bomb-proof. We, we don't we don't ever want to get a call saying that you're unhappy with something or that the product failed. So we have to take a lot of guesswork out of we never know who's putting these things up. So with that being said, it has to be uh, simple enough but at the same time strong enough to survive. Uh, the other thing that's in place, particularly on this one, is it is an NRCS grant. So we worked with the local grant office and saying, hey, this is the prototype, this is our track record. We already uh, have worked with the NRCS on, on numerous tunnels. Here we go. Uh, will you grant us uh, a, a special voucher to say, look, this is a prototype. Uh, we don't have stamped engineer drawings on this today, but we have to build this to get those stamped engineer drawings. So that, all that was taken into account. Uh, it's a local agency. Uh, I'm about 45 minutes from where our warehouse is. And so the right farmer to say, yes, you can come build this and you can work out your kinks on my property. We'll, I'll help you build it. You can help us build it. Uh, we'll allow you to come film. So all that stuff comes into play. We had to have the right perfect place to put this thing. I'm not putting it in my house. So once that was all done and we're working with the NRCS and we're working up with our vendors, now that the prototype is uh, about halfway to completion, we'll be putting on the plastic next week. Now we can go back to our vendors, we can go back to our, our design guy and go, look, this is the changes we want to make. We can go to our hardware suppliers and like, that, that bolt wasn't long enough, this screw head wasn't, I didn't like X, Y, or Z about it. And we can take care of all that thing on the back end before you even get it. And so we decided to go ahead and put this out. Number one, we're excited about it. I couldn't wait any longer to, to say. Uh, but number two, it's important for us to, that you guys know all the things, that, all the ways that it actually gets to your property. So talking about transparency in food, we talk about food miles. This is transparency in manufacturing where we have greatly reduced the amount of manufacturing miles that goes into a lot of our products, especially the hoop houses. And so with all that being said, now, once we're getting close to this, the design changes are minimal. Once we go through and make those changes, it then has to go into production. And production means we're selling 20 footers, we're selling 14, 14 footers currently at a pretty record pace. So we can't run out of that at the same time we're, we're having this whole new product developed. So we have to wait our turn within our own process uh, to get these things up and running. So. That's kind of where we're at. If I had to guess, uh, realistically, it's probably going to be another three months before we're ready to go, hey, this is, this is up. So if you're thinking about a 30-foot house for next year, know that this thing is going to be bomb-proof. It's coming uh, mid to late spring 2021. That's some of the behind the scenes. And uh, tomorrow I'll be able to share you some more at another interesting facility. So uh, you see that next week. Anyway, thanks a lot. See you.